Welcome to another episode of Theological Thursdays. My name is Nicole. It is an honor to serve you on this evening. Last week, we talked about altars and we talked about all of the different components of the altar. We talked about how the old altars, well, the first mentioned altars were of stone or they were from the earth. They were hollow in the middle and there was shittim wood that was placed on top of the altar as well as the sacrifice and the fire on the altar was the manifestation of heaven touching earth. And then we talked about what that meant for us spiritually today. I encourage you to check out last week's episode if you missed it. This week, we're going to talk about servicing the altar. And so when we're looking at servicing the altar, we're looking at what do those components exactly mean today? Because see, everything in the Old Testament isn't done away with. There's a spiritual component of that. The things that the Hebrews had to do in the Old Testament times were fulfilled through Yahusha HaMashiach. And given that it was fulfilled, we return to the spiritual principles that once governed and uh, was lived out by Adam and Eve before the fall. We've returned to that place. The Messiah, when he came on earth, he walked in that same authority as well. Before we go any further, let's have a word of prayer. Abba, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to your people. I thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your love towards us. Father, I ask that you would just be glorified in this broadcast, that light would shine in dark places. I bind the spirit of confusion and distraction. And Father, I pray that your perfect peace would abound on the hearers, that you would unstop deaf ears, that you would remove scales from blinded eyes, Father God, and that spiritual healing would be manifested through the truth and knowledge that is conveyed on this evening. In Yahusha HaMashiach's name we pray. Amen. So tonight we're going to look at Numbers 18. Numbers 18 provides us with the duty, the duties of the priests and the Levites. Okay, so I'm going to read Numbers 18 from verse 1 through 7. And then um, as I go along, we're going to also do a little bit of dissecting as well. Okay, so when we look at uh, verse 1, it says, So the Lord, or as you know, um, here, Yahuwah, so Yahuwah, so Yahuwah said to Aaron, you and your sons, your father's house with you, shall bear iniquity connected with the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear iniquity connected with the priesthood. Now, what's interesting about this is that word iniquity. That word iniquity in the Hebrew is aven. And what it means is perverse. Uh, depravity, guilt, punishment, um, and, and, and guilt of conditions, consequences. So he's telling them that they're going to bear that. So they are going to carry the weight of Israel's iniquity, of Israel's punishment. And I think it's really interesting because if we go forward, fast forward to the New Testament, the thing that comes to mind is the passage in 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 2 and 12, where he says that if you endure um, with me, you will reign with me. In the King James Version, it says, if you suffer with me, you'll reign with me. And so here we see that the priest suffer with the uh with 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 god of heaven okay he suffers it's almost like a um a long suffering right a long suffering that they do in this uh place here okay and so let's continue let's go back to the text and so in verse two it says and you um and with you bring your brothers also the tribe of levi the tribe of your father that they may join you and minister to you while you and your sons with you are before the tent of testimony. Some versions have uh, the tent of meetings. Okay. And so um, 
I think it's interesting here too, just to pause just a little bit, because a lot of times when we separate the 12 tribes, we, um, uh, there, there may be a misconception that all Levites are priests. And as we can see in this text, there's a definitive difference from, uh, the tribe of Levi, those who are called to be priests and Levite. And then there's even a distinction from those who are called to be priests and Aaron and his sons. There's, there's separation there. There's levels, there's levels to it. Okay. Um, they shall keep guard over you and over the whole tent. You shall not come near. Um, they shall not come near the vessels of the sanctuary or the altar, lest they and you die. Um, they shall join you and keep guard over the tent of meeting for all service of the tent and no outsider, no outsider shall come near you. You shall keep guard over the sanctuary and over the altar that there may never again be wrath on the people of Israel. Behold, I have taken your brothers, the Levites, from among the people of Israel. They are a gift to you, given to the Lord, to do the service of the tent of meeting. And you and your sons with you shall guard your priesthood for all that concerns the altar that is within the veil, and you shall serve. I give your priesthood as a gift. And any outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Now, what's interesting about this and the relevance of this to today's time is that we've all been restored back to that sense of priesthood. Adam and Eve, before they fell uh, and, and they, they sinned against God, they were a royal priesthood. And so here we see God has attached himself to a specific people and in his attachment to this specific people, he picks out a particular bunch and attaches to them and gifts them with the role of priesthood. And so this is relevant because as I mentioned, fast forward, those who believe, if you confess in your heart and believe um, with your mouth, if you, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Yahushua HaMashiach is Lord, then you are saved. And having that sense of salvation, you are restored back to the priestly mandate, okay? Um, now, given it takes time to learn to walk into that and understand the level of that mantle, but those things are gifted to you through the door, which is Yahushua HaMashiach. Okay, um, now I want to go back and I want to look at some of these words. So when we look at the word sanctuary, um, the sanctuary here where the people are able to go beyond the veil is the sacred place, the holy place, um, a temple, okay? Uh, another word for that is uh, ohel in the Hebrew. Ohel um, is, is the word for tent. So you have the, um, the sanctuary um, or the, the sanctuary, and then you have ohel, which is the tent, which is a dwelling place, a covering, a home, um, a tabernacle. Okay, and then we have of meeting. So you have the tent of meeting. And so that meeting place is an appointed place in the Hebrew. It's a mode, okay? Um, and, and what that means is an appointed place, an appointed time, a sacred season, a set feast, an appointed season, an appointed place, sign, or signal, um, is what is happening. So where we have uh, these different terminologies throughout the passage, what God is saying is that what you're tending to is sacred. It is precious. It's a covering. It's my dwelling place. And see, it's not to be taken lightly. And so this is why he's giving order to the people. 
And I thought it was really interesting in the one passage how he discusses, I believe it's in verse uh, five, where he discusses that um, the priests aren't permitted to touch the vessels. Um, the vessels are considered the furnishings, okay? Uh, Kelly, Kelly, Kelly is how it's said in the Hebrew. And so these are articles, vessels, um, utensils, and things of that sort, furnishings. They are not permitted to touch those things that deal with the altar, whether it be uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the vessels that hold the oil, uh, the shittim wood that may be set aside um, and maybe even the sacrifice, they are not permitted to touch that. And nobody outside of the high priest is permitted to go into the Holy of Holy. Glory be to God. And then it says that for those who profane the altar, for those who profane, who desecrate this sacred place for appointed times and appointed seasons and appointed place for those who profane this area death will be their lot now i think it's really interesting because this word death in the hebrew is muth and muth is first seen in genesis 2 and 17 i believe genesis 2 and 17 and in that passage it says that if you eat from the tree of knowledge, you will surely die. And so here we see it again, that anyone who profanes it, that the priest that profanes it will die, as well as uh, the, uh, the one of the sons of Aaron. They too will be affected by this. And so this death is a... It, it, I mean, it could be physical. It could be physical because we know from the Old Testament when people went into the Holy of Holies, they didn't always come out. Okay, so we're aware of that, but it also could be a spiritual death. It can be a separation of that which is holy. Because in this passage, he tells them that they are to uh, the cleanliness of, of who they are if we read down a little bit further in numbers it talks about those who are clean and those who are unclean and so we know that the cleanliness and that is representation of their life that is representation of their obedience to the law their obedience to yahuwah those who walk in that have certain rights and privileges and so because those individuals have certain rights and privileges, blessings befall them. In fact, the blessings of the Lord don't just befall them, they overtake them and they follow those individuals. But for those who are unclean or for those who step outside of um, what Yahuwah is requesting in servicing his sacred place, his holy place. See, let me, let me just pause here because... Uh, the ability to be able to service the altar of the King of Kings, the ability to be able to service the altar of the Lord of Lords. I mean, with, with these hands and, and this brain and, and this body, like what? But the love of God could deem you worthy to do such a sacred thing. And see, to be bestowed and entrusted to do such a thing is an honor and a privilege. And so what he's saying to them is not so much hell and brimstone. He's just saying, I've given you a gift because I love you. I've, 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 I've allowed you to take part in something that allows us to be in communion with one another. Not only does it allow us to be in communion, but you can commune with me on behalf of other people. That is a sacred, whoo, a sacred thing. A sacred thing. I mean, I think in this culture, we take it for granted to be able to grab hands and pray for someone 
boldly go before the throne of grace and, and pray with someone, but look at where we've come from. Before you needed prayer or you needed to hear from God or you needed to commune with God, you had to go and meet with the intercessor. And the intercessor would then take on your iniquities. He would take that on and then he would lay that on the sacrifice. He would lay his hands on the sacrifice. And so the iniquity that he took on and your iniquity would be placed on the sacrifice. And then the fire on the altar would consume it and your sins would be forgiven. Or there would be a, 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 a offer of thanksgiving or an offer of, of worship. This is the road that we have come from. Ooh, glory be to God. Glory be to God for the door. Okay, so we have come from <laughs> immeasurable limbs um, in, in such a, a short amount of time. I mean, we, we think that 2,000 years is a long time ago, but even before that, I mean, this is... It's a short distance, you know. He didn't wait that long before he provided his own lamb, before the ram in the bush was Yahusha HaMashiach. And so um, what does this mean for us today? What does this mean for us today? It's not just about uh, grabbing hands and interceding for other people. Uh, the altar, servicing the altar in an institution um, or, or the, the institution of the church, servicing the altar consists of the fivefold ministry. If we look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, it says, Paul the apostle says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the sons of God unto the perfect, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Mashiach. Hallelujah. Glory be to Yah. So what happens now is rather than having a specific tribe, a specific group, all those who believe um, are now taking part in the servicing of the altar. And of those, there are some who walk in the office of the apostle, walk in the office of the prophet, the office of the teacher, the office of the evangelist, the pastor, okay? And so through walking in these offices, you are able to then work with the perfecting of the saints. Now you may say, Nicole, okay, so what do those roles look like? What, what does that role look like? The apostle is the planter. Not only is the apostle a planter of churches, but the apostle has a specific doctrine. Okay, I know a lot in our culture, it's really, really common to throw that word around. And um, apostle has a specific doctrine. Not only do they have a specific doctrine, but healing, healing is a part of their apostolic walk. They are able to heal the sick, okay? Um, and, and, and miracles, signs, and wonders. I don't want to limit that, okay? And then the, the prophet. Now see, Paul walked in the office of the apostle, and we know that Paul perform uh, miracles and things of that sort. But Paul usually had a prophet with him, Barnabas. Because see, what does the what does the prophet do? The prophet points, okay, the doctrine. And, 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 and the, I don't want to limit the apostle because see, the, the apostle can prophesy, the apostle can teach, the apostle can, can, can pastor. It's limiting to him, but he can he can do those things and the apostle can be an evangelist. I mean, and I think we see that very clearly with the apostle Paul. The apostle Paul, uh, his, his evangelism is still happening today. Glory be to Yah. Amen. Um, so um, the prophet then hears a word from God and he points. 
he gives the trajectory of where the body of Christ is going. Okay. And so once we have the trajectory of where the body of Christ going, the teachers, the teachers come in and say, this is the instruction. This is how we implement it. This is how we move forward based on scripture, based on what we believe. Okay. And the pastors, the pastors then work um, amongst the body as triage. Okay. And it, what they do is they uh, deal with the wounds of the people, the, the afflictions, the, 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 the deliverance and, and all of those different things. They're, they're, they're the triage unit They're They are the hospital for the body. Okay. Um, like, uh, not, not so much, uh, it could be doctor or nurse. Okay. That's the role that they play. And I don't, I don't want to, I'm not trying to minimize it or anything like that, but nurse is very personable. Nurses is, is very nurturing and, and, and very, uh, you, you see them often accessible. Um, doctors, <laughs> they will write a script and take off. And so that's, that's what I mean by that. I'm not trying to lessen the role or anything like that. I'm just uh, giving it the way it is, period. And then the evangelist. The evangelist goes out and get them. The evangelist go and, and get them. The evangelist has the, uh, the ability to go into dark spaces and to win the loss and, and bring them in, to reel them back in for, your, for the kingdom of Yahuwah. Okay, so these are the offices that have been given and these offices service the tent of meeting, the places of gathering where the people are gathered together. The, these offices through the working of these gifts um, service the people for the perfecting of the saints. That's what it says for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. Okay. And so, um, and, and now that we're in this new space and we all have been endowed with the Holy spirit, what happens is all of us have access to the Holy of Holy, right? There's, there's not anything that none of us don't have access to, but we all function in our, um, in our offices. Uh, and it's, it's equitable. It's equitable. It's no little eyes and big U's. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be big eyes and big U's. This was meant for the perfecting of the saint. And it, and honestly, you should look at it like all of these five gifts, these, the five fold ministry is all 20% right? Everything is 20%. And so if all of them are 20%, when they're all operating together, then the church can come into their fullness. The believers can come into their fullness. The presence of God can come into the fullness in the atmosphere. Okay. Um, but if you don't have five, if you, if you only got one or, or a couple, um, you're, you're not operating at your, uh, fullness and the altar of Yahuwah, the sacred space is not being tended to properly. Now you may say, okay, well, we don't have a sacred space no more, Nicole. I mean, we, we don't have like this physical altar. We, we don't have the Shittim wood. You're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, where, where the altar now is the heart. So if we look at Ezekiel 36, um, verses 26 and 27, I, I mean, I, I love the prophet Ezekiel. He says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey me. So what's happening here is that the law isn't um, like in, in Matthew, he says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, right? And so he, the fulfillment of the law removes us from the place of works. That's what it is. It removes us from the place of our works and pushes us to a place where faith is our currency and the law 
is not only a law governed by faith, but it is a law of love. And that law of love uh, goes back to loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And when we love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, we begin to alter our behaviors. We begin to surrender our emotions and our thoughts, not because we have to, but because we love him. And the working of the Holy Spirit leads us to a place where we then don the mind of Christ. And the breastplate of righteousness is no longer covering a heart that is broken or fragmented, but has been healed and mended through the working of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And so we don't, um, we don't overthrow the law, right? Right? We uphold the law. But this law that Paul is talking about in Romans uh, 8 and uh, Romans, excuse me, 3 and 31, the upholding of the law is, as I mentioned, love. The law of love, the law of, of faith, the law of righteousness, the law of justice. See, in each and every one of us, there is a code of conduct. There is something in you that no matter where you go, you know if you've hurt someone, if you've offended someone, if you've done something outside of how we are conditioned to behave as human beings. Now, granted, sometimes this happens um, unintentionally, but even when it does, happen mistakenly, we are aware that we've offended someone. We're aware that we hurt someone. What is it inside of us that jolts our spirit to that knowledge? What is it inside of us that can connect even with language barriers, even in other countries? How is that possible? There is a morality code that is written in our DNA. And that morality code that is written in our DNA is the rules and the laws that God established and placed within our DNA when he carved Adam from the dirt. When he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, he spoke himself into us. He spoke justice into us, righteousness into us, truth into us, love into us, grace, mercy into us. And so because those things are rooted in our DNA, no matter who you are or where you come from, we're not just good people for the sake of being good people. You know, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, some people say, well, I, I don't believe in any of these things. I just... You know, I, I'm just a nice person. I'm just a good person. Where does that ideology come from? I mean, can we be good outside of our own self? Isn't that whole idea of good and bad subjective? It is, but there is certain things that are definitive lines, right? There's definitive lines. Most people can agree that murder is not good. Most people can agree to that. Most people can agree that a stranger coming up to you and assaulting you is not good. What tells us not to do that? What tells us that that behavior is not a good behavior and to smile at people or wave at people or, you know, um, be kind to someone, cheer someone up, encourage someone that that's a good behavior. All it is to say, um, the heart is the altar. The heart is the altar. And the heart is being serviced by the people of God. It should be being serviced by that five-fold ministry. And even on an individual basis, we can begin to service the altar through um, worship, through spending time with Yah. I mean, he... A lot of times we only spend time with the most high when things are difficult. 
It's easy to spend time with him when things are difficult, when uh, things aren't going our way. You know, when things are great, though, when I mean, when we're on that, we're no longer on the uphill and we, we have that mountaintop experience. Um, it's easy to kind of forget. It's easy to always make time to service the altar. And that altar is the altar in your heart. It's, 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 it's easy to kind of shy away from, you know, moments with God. Whether it's spending 10 minutes when you wake up, thanking him for waking you up, telling him how great he is and what you want the day to be, or maybe taking a moment to read a chapter or two in the Bible and meditate on that throughout your day, or maybe just taking time to pray throughout the day and talk to him or even including him in your day, including him in your life, including him in your planning. That's servicing that altar. That's ensuring that the fire on the altar doesn't go out. That's ensuring that his presence manifests because see where the fire is, it purges everything that ain't like him. Where the fire is, it consumes the old nature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things become new because the fire is on the altar. So serving the, servicing the altar is multifaceted. Forgive me, I got off a little bit on a tangent and kind of went a little philosophical because I really wanted you to understand the nature of the heart and the spirit and the value of being able to service those things, right? There are parts of us that we can't quite put our finger on. There are areas in our life that we can't quite name, but we know they exist. We know they exist. And so what is that that's been given to us? Friends, it's the image of God. The image of God reigning on the inside of you. The image of God crying and, 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 and pleading for you to turn from your wicked ways and humble yourself and pray so that he can hear from heaven so that he can heal you and heal the land. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. So there's some things, a lot of things that we talked about. Um, we talked about Numbers 18, and we did like a word study in some of those areas in there, talking about how the priests carried the iniquity of those others. And, and let me just touch on that as well, because um, I found that when I go into certain areas, when I'm ministering to certain areas consistently, I kind of sense the spirit of that place, the despair of that place, or the hopelessness of that place. Um, a lot of times, if sometimes you're praying with a specific person, you may be able to tap in and zone in on exactly what's going on with that person. Uh, maybe you may feel a physical symptom, a, a headache, and that, that individual may experience those things. So you take that on as an intercessor right? Because that's what we are. We intercede on behalf of other people. And so as we service that altar, not only are we servicing it so that the fire continues to, um, uh, never goes out, you know, and we continue to fan that flame. We're not doing it just for that, but we're also doing it so that we are able to intercede for other people. We are ensuring that our lives remain holy and acceptable unto Yah so that it may be a sweet fragrance in his nostrils. And so given that is a sweet fragrance in his nostrils, when we boldly go before the throne of grace, we are able to not only give thanksgiving, but we are also able to 
um, make requests. And remember, he says, anything that you ask in my name, I will give to you. He also says in Matthew, seek ye first the kingdom of Yahuwah and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So as, as we're seeking him, we have to ensure that the altar is intact. And if the altar is intact, we have to ensure that we are servicing that thing correctly. And if we are servicing that thing correctly, when we go before the throne of grace and we make requests or we make decrees, hey, Glory be to God. He hears us. Hey, glory. Glory. I felt that all in my spirit. Glory be to God. Well, the scripture says that um, the people die for a lack of knowledge. I'm grateful that on this Thursday and every Thursday going forth, knowledge goes forth in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. May Yahuwah bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and give you his shalom. Grace and peace.